So welcome again um, to our event today, um, No Limits to Growth, a societal transformation scenario for staying below 1.5. My name is Linda Schneider. I'm with the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin, and I'll be hosting today's uh, discussion. So first of all, I would like to thank um, Konzeptwerk Neue Ökonomie in Leipzig for collaborating with us um, on this study and also on this, on this event today. And um, just a couple of um, housekeeping information. So all of you um, online on Zoom can use the Q&A tool. Um, you can use it to ask questions to the panelists and you can also vote um, for questions so that we can pick um, the most popular ones. Also the chat box, um, you can use that for, um, as you're already doing, <laughs> um for exchanges um amongst um the whole group and we'll also use it to um to share some uh additional information like links or other resources and you also um you're also welcome to um you know share materials that um you feel like sharing um okay so before um i give you some background um on um, on why um, why we did the study that, that we're presenting today and the discussion that we're trying to kick off. Um, I would like to introduce our two speakers today um, and also thank them very much for, for joining us today. So uh, maybe both of you, Kai and Diana, can turn on uh, their cameras. So first, uh, Kai Kuhnhen, um, who works with the Konzeptwerk Neue Ökonomie in Leipzig, and um, has previously worked with the Federal Environmental Agency also on, on climate uh, mitigation scenarios. And he's one of the co-authors of the study we're discussing today. Secondly, Diana Urgenvorsatz, um, who's a professor at Central U European University and a vice chair of Working Group 3 on mitigation at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC for short. And um, yeah, so we're very grateful for um, having both of you with us today for the discussion. Uh, welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. So maybe just some short background on um, on the discussion we're trying to kick off today. So basically, back in 2018, when the special report on um, on global warming of 1.5 degrees came out, um, uh, we realized that many um, many of the scenarios or you know, most of them um, relied on large scale so-called um, negative emissions. And many of them also implied um, um, a dangerous temperature overshoot of 1.5. So overshooting uh, the 1.5 temperature limit and then trying to return to 1.5 by the end of the century. At the same time, what we did, did was uh, publish a short analysis um, of assumptions of economic growth in the available scenario literature. And we found that virtually all of them rely on economic growth across all regions and until the end of, um, of the century and potentially even beyond, but that's where the scenario stops, so we don't really know. And from our, from our perspective, that's, that's quite a big problem because um, we both find it very dangerous to rely on those large scale technologies to remove CO2 from the atmosphere that are neither tested nor proven at scale and that also come with large scale um, social and environmental risks. And also, um, we find it really dangerous to, um, you know, to bet on an overshoot and then return um, to a one to a climate of 1.5 afterwards. So what we realized is that we also needed um, need to explore mitigation options that are beyond um, um, the mainstream of of current uh, mitigation scenarios and also beyond um, the you know the current growth dependent mainstream of scenarios. So then together with a team of five researchers, what we did um, was to start developing um, the scenario that we just launched um, last week and that we're presenting today in this, um, um, in this event, um, which we call the societal transformation scenario. And that is at least one of the first um, to limit global warming to 1.5 without relying on risk technologies like CCS, geoengineering um, and nuclear energy, but that instead explores at least some options of limiting production and consumption in, in the global north. So 
to the extent that we want to call um, the STS, as we call it, the societal transformation scenario, uh, to the extent that we, we, that we want to call it a degrowth uh, scenario, it's very important for us to stress that um, the, those reductions in production and consumption um, occur in the global north and then, um, um, you know, in turn, allow for an increase in consumption in the global south. Um, before I hand over to Kai to um, give us a short um, input and presentation on this on the scenario that we did, um, we also find it important just to flag that um, the scenario that we did really is meant as an invitation to debate for you know for a debate on um, on what potential future trajectories and future future <laughs> what potential futures um, are available to us. Um, as society, so it's not it's not meant as any sort of prescriptive route to take. Obviously, so um, take it as an invitation to debate, and not as you know, there's no claim to perfection or any of any of that. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it here for uh, just my first introductory comments, and I'll hand over to uh, to Kai to give us an input on the scenario that we did. Yes, thank you very much, Linda, for the introduction. And I also welcome all the viewers. Um, my name is Kai. I work for the Concept Bag Neue Economie, or Laboratory for New Economic Ideas in English. And I'm going to try to tell you as much as I can about the societal transformation scenario in 15 minutes. So let me just share my screen, and then you can see what I see. All right, um, Linda already talked a little bit about um, about the motivation, and I'm going to talk about the key premises now. Start with the key premises. We had four of them. The first one was that the countries of the global north have to act. The second one that consumption and production have to be reduced. The third is that a good life for all with less is possible. And the fourth is an exclusion of nuclear and negative emission technologies. I'm not going to talk a lot about the first two, but I will start with the third. And if there's questions about the first two, we can have them in the discussion later on, maybe. All right, a good life for others with less is possible. Um, there's a lot of um, mainstream economic arguments against this, and I will present them and then uh, also present the rebuttals from the um, degrowth or post growth community. The first one is that um, production and consumption can be decoupled from emissions. So there's actually no need to make do with less. And the answer to this is that this is not this is not true, or at least has never happened to the extent that we need it. Usually, whenever it happens, it's uh, the emissions are only exported to other countries. The second is that material wealth correlates with well-being. So any scenario where we have less material wealth is actually a dystopian scenario, and it's something that nobody could really want. And to that, there are two answers. One is that this correlation is actually not true anymore in saturated societies. Um, and secondly, that well-being is multidimensional. And uh, degrowth or post-growth proponents, proponents actually say that there's a lot of our needs that we sacrifice in order to produce more and consume more, such as protection, creativity, idleness, and freedom and participation. And then the third point is that the third argument is that without more production and consumption, we face a recession, a crisis, social hardships, and so on. And this is, of course, true if we look at um, at, at the kind of degrowth we see in the real world, which is not what we what we imagine when we talk about this this topic. Uh, and I would say that that's why why we say that it has to be part of a social ecological transformation and not just a reduction of consumption and no, no other changes. This is about, and now to the fourth premise, the exclusion of nuclear and negative emission technologies. First of all, what do we mean with this? Um, there's a couple of things that, that fall under this. BECCS is uh, very, um, very much in the debate. It's the use of biomass and then capturing the CO2 of the emissions and store it underground. CCS is the same, but with fossil fuels. CDRs, um, uh, 
carbon dioxide removal. It's uh, taking CO2 from the atmosphere and actually storing it underground again. And then we have more, um, more out there solutions like solar radiation ma management, where we actually try to reduce the incoming sunlight or reflect it in some other ways. And then there's, of course, all other kinds of things like uh, ocean um, uh, putting stuff in the, in the ocean to, to, to make it absorb more CO2. And we have two problems with this. One is that we kind of see this path that we are on. Let's say humanity is this train and we're on this path and we're heading towards a cliff. And um, this cliff is, of course, a catastrophic climate change. And we, we just assume or we hope that by the time we reach the cliff, there will be a bridge. And this bridge is, of course, these uh, negative emission technologies. And it's not only will it be there, but it will work fine and the, uh, the consequences of it will be bearable. And I'm, I'm very much doubtful about that, or I'm fearful of these solutions. I think they're very risky. And I, don't, I think what we don't see is that we can actually slow down the train and maybe take, it, make it, take another path. This is the one thing. And the other one is that if we go the route of reducing consumption and production, this can actually be a democratically planned process. We can decide together what we want to produce and what kind of um, labor and um, environmental degradation we, we we, 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 we want to, we can accept for this production. And this should be a planned process. We don't argue for some, something else. Instead, if we rely on these negative emission technologies, because there are these large scale, scale technologies that we, we have to rely on governments and corporations to make the right decisions, to develop the technology, to create the right legal framework, to put in place the right incentives and employ it responsibly. And when I look at the governments around the world, but especially if I look around the, uh, the companies, especially uh, multinational co corporations, I'm very, I'm very fearful that they will do this in a, in a reasonable manner. So much for um, the premises, now to the methodology. Usually when you make global mitigation models, you use what is called an integrated assessment model. Um, and there's like five or six in the world that are being used by very few people. And they are very complex models, a lot of data, but also the math is not that simple. And they're the pl a black box for most, for most of the people, for the, the large majority. And there's also a lot of data that is not being presented and the documentation is not as good as at least I would like it to be. And the second thing is that they, they don't try to just present what will happen if we do this and that. They, they don't say if we do A, then we, B will be the result, but they try to optimize, they try to find out what is the best scenario to reach a certain mitigation target. What is the cost efficient way to stay within 1.5 degrees? And in order to do that, they need cost estimates. They need cost estimates for fossil fuels, but also for renewable energies. And they need these um, estimates until um, 2100, which I think is a rather difficult task to come up with these cost estimates, because usually, uh, in my experience, it's hard to foresee what the oil price will be in five years, let alone in 50 years. And then secondly, um, these to, to make these optimizations, you have to have certain moral and ethical choices, like what do you actually optimize on? And usually what they optimize on is consumption per person. So um, there's a lot of questions that are being answered, like do we actually want to save the climate now or later? And there we have the interest rate that comes in, or do we want to have more leisure time or do we want to, more to consume more as a people? And all these questions are, um, are put into these algorithms and they are not open for debate because nobody actually knows what's in these models. So I think they're actually good, good tools, maybe for short or midterm scenarios, but, but not for the long term. <laughs> Instead, we used something called the global calculator, which is um, a rather simple tool. It's actually, on, you can find it online actually and use it yourself. It's open source. There's actually an Excel file that you can just download. Um, we had to adapt some of it to for our for our purposes. So it's not perfect, but I think it's a, definitely a step in the right direction. And there's no optimization, so all the decisions lie with the users. Like you have to decide um, what, how many kilometers will be driven with with a car or with a train, and how much meat will be eaten, and all these things, and what kind of technology will be used. And I think that's a big plus as well. 
And I think these things enable actually an open discussion about not uh, what kind of mitigation technology we, uh, is, how, is how expensive um, or what kind of technologies we want to use when, but actually how do we want to live in 2050 or 2100. And I think that's the discussion we need to have in a very democratic and broad society. All right, now the assumptions, and I'm, I'm just going to talk about the, the consumption side here because that's like the special thing about a scenario, like the the technological side there, this is all the scenarios, but this is this is other things that are distinct in ours. We And I'm just going to point out a few. In the transport sector, for example, we see that we assume that by 2050, we have 81% less cars in urban areas and 52% in rural areas. And the flights per person fall from uh, for, fall to one per year in 2025 and zero uh, and um, and one flight every three years in 2050 and of course this is all only valid for the global north for the global south actually these consumption parameters we we expect them to increase so that by 2050 we have some kind of convergence And now coming to housing and food, we I just want to point out two things. We assume that the living space will be reduced by 25% per person. Now that does not mean that every room will be shrinking or every, anything like that. It could also just mean that we have less single households on, 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 and more communal living and trends like that. And then finally, uh, meat consumption. We assume a reduction of meat consumption in the global north by 60% by 2030 and then remain constant. And that is very important, uh, especially red meat is a very uh, big driver of greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, we have all these very ambitious technological developments. These, uh, without any like ambitious te te technological developments, it's actually I think it's not possible to stay within 1.5 degrees or even two degrees. So this is uh, this is also a lot of data, but uh, that I cannot present here because it would need too much time. But you can find it in the study. All right, and of course these are very um, dry numbers, and um, we try to make clear in the study that um, this is this, these numbers have to be part of a bigger transformation, which we call a socio-ecological transformation, and the goal of it would be to refocus our society to fulfill human needs and not uh, grow the GDP or whatever, and to foster cooperation, care, solidarity, and sustainability in order to achieve a good life for all. Now, I understand this is quite abstract, so I brought a few um, first measures that would be important. For example, um, taxing, uh, the taxing the use of the environment more and not taxing um, labor as much. Reducing working hours, um, introducing a basic income and a maximum wage. So as you can see, of course, redistribution is a very big topic in this scenario. Redistribution of wealth and power. But we also have cultural changes like deceleration of life and we, of course, uh, the democratization of decision making. And I don't, in, don't only mean like referendums or local referendums, but I also mean, for example, in, the, in your company, like too many like the, the this decision making companies is very very hierarchical and very few people decide what what is actually being produced and how and of course um, this all we imagine this all through a bottom up process i don't I, we don't believe that there's a master plan that we should follow but these things have to evolve and have to be done and together with with a lot of people to talk about these things all right now to the results um, i just show the highlights this is the energy demand in Annex 1 countries. Annex 1 countries is sort of the OECD countries or the global north in, in short. And we see um, decreases uh, in demand from 2020 on. And there, these are the result of, of course, the less consumption, but also more efficiency. And these drops are significant, for, especially in the transport and building sector, and a little bit less in the industrial sector. Industrial is the CCM or um, line and that is because the industry still has to do some heavy lifting when it comes to the energy transition a lot of new, uh, a lot of wind power plants have to be built and stuff like that now this is the same figure for non-annex bond countries or the global south 
And there we see that um, actually in the industry, the energy demand increases and the decreases in the other sectors are also much less pronounced. And that is because we don't assume uh, a reduction in consumption and the, the decreases are only the result of more efficiency. Now, this is the resulting primary energy production, and this is uh, globally, that's the whole world. Of course, since um, the energy demand is dropping, the primary energy production also drops, and we see that the fossil fuels um, become very uh, negligible. In 2050, they make up um, less than 10%. And we also see a phase out of nuclear, that's at the very bottom, and we see a large increase in solar, wind, and tidal energy too to become the bulk of our primary energy production, energy production. And now the, of course, the most important um, result maybe is the, the emissions. This, uh, in red, you can see the emissions from 2020 to 2100 in gigaton CO2. <coughs> and we see that by 2030, we have a reduction of 50%. So actually that's like, if you wanna um, make these ambitious mitigation targets, you have to have very, very strong decreases in greenhouse gas emissions in the next decade. And then by 2050, it goes, it, their, their emissions are further reduced by 72%. And then I want to point to the um, orange um, area below the zero line. That is actually the CO2 emission reductions from changes in land use. It's because since, since we, um, Eat, we throw away less food and we eat less meat. We actually have a lot of um, former agriculture area that becomes free and it can be used to restore natural ecosystems or it can be managed sustainably and thereby becoming a, a sink for CO2 emissions. And we assume that they go up to four gigatons per year of a sink, which is a conservative guess. And this is a figure that stays constant from I think 2050 on. And um, the cumulative emissions are 320 gigatons in our scenario, which would give us a two third chance or a 66% chance to stay within 1.5 degrees. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the questions and um, also the comments by Diana. Thank you very much, Kai for this uh, presentation. Um, maybe we can just start briefly um, with a couple of um, clarification questions, perhaps. Um, some of them were in, in the chat box um, already. So um, um, one, uh, one reviewer has pointed out um, that the year in which our scenario hits net zero is in a way quite late in 2062. Um, so maybe you can you could share, just comment um, on why that is and why that was actually in a way a conscious decision um, that we that we took. Yes, um, from a purely scientific point of view, as I said, it's most important that uh, a lot happens in the next decade. But um, I understand, I mean, I, I worked at the Environment Agency. I understand the, the, the necess necessity for having these targets. And I think 2050 is a very reasonable target for net zero emissions in the global north. We don't have it in this scenario because we actually don't have um, the emissions distinguished between the global north and global south. We don't have the, the information. That is the one, one um, reason why we, we have this number of 2062 and not 2050. And the other is that in our in the model, there's a few processes that rely on uh, fossil fuels, such as primary steel production, where you need coking coal. And that is something that was true uh, until a few years ago. But uh, and the, the model actually has no, no alternative. But now there are alternatives already underway and being, uh, being introduced. So that's maybe uh, just a little shortcoming of the model that there's no alternative. Um, there's another set of questions around um, our assumptions on population development in the global north and in the global south. Maybe you can comment on 
um, on our assumptions there. And also a question um, around um, how to um, how to provide a good life for nine or 10 or 11 billion people on the planet, uh, on the planet, on the planet, planet, sorry, uh, without environmental collapse um, or runaway climate change. Yes, the population question, I would have to look at what the, um, what our scenario was. I think we rely on, uh, Ah, yeah, we, we, there was a scenario for population stems from the medium variant of the UNDP World Population Prospect 2019 report. And um, you can find more in the report. Uh, it foresees an increase in population, but um, not a very steep. And the second was how it's possible to, to OK, yeah. I think right now we're doing a very bad job um, providing a good life for pe people on this planet while trying to protect the environment. I think if we if we started redistributing um, our wealth, we would already be in a much better position. And I think there's um, there's a lot of room for um, redirecting our idea of what it means to have a good life and get away from this very material idea of the more I, I have, the more I possess, the better my life is to, to a situation where you say the more um, time I have, for example, the more leisure time I have, the more um, relationships I have, the better my life is, and I think this is this is a transformation that we have to make, and um, that I think is, is more like a simple simple answer for now. Okay, and I guess as as another sort of um, answer to that question, we could also say that right now it's also not the problem is not the number of people on the planet, but planet right, but rather the levels of consumption and the overall levels of production globally that not necessarily benefit anyone on the planet planet why is that word so difficult um okay um right now i'd like to um invite diana uh, to come on stage turn on her camera um if that's possible and um uh, if you would like just um just respond to what you've heard to the scenario um let us know what you think and um what your assessment is of the relevance perhaps of such scenarios that explore alternative uh, mitigation options beyond the mainstream, if you will. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, say a couple of thoughts uh, based on these very interesting new uh, scenarios. First of all, um, let me uh, play a little bit of uh, the devil's advocate and, and just uh, defend the IMs uh, to some extent. It's true that there has been a lot of criticism, a lot of concern about their black box nature, but uh, but there is a strong effort in uh, making them more accessible and more um, more uh, transparent. For example, the six assessment report is putting a very uh, major emphasis on on uh, an annex in which a lot of these assumptions detailed, and also there are um, many. Uh, there is, for example, a website uh, on the YASA where you can actually, you yourself can play with the uh, scenarios, change inputs and see how the outputs uh, are then changing. So, so to some extent, it's you can control some of the parameters yourself. So it's not absolutely as evil as, as uh, it has been projected. And there are not only five or six IEMs, but uh, actually a lot of IEMs. I wouldn't be able to tell the number, but there are at least uh, 20, so dozens of IEMs, and they have many, many rats. Nevertheless, uh, I think by and large, uh, the points that were raised uh, in this presentation are very valid. Um, uh, concerns reflecting a lot of the scientific community. So the, the concern about uh, the over-reliance or a very heavy reliance on negative emissions technologies and um, perhaps nuclear or less, but definitely that's, um, that's a concern that many of the scientists have as well, also within the IPCC. Uh, I would recommend, for example, a paper from, I think, Kevin Anderson and um, um, Glenn Peters from Science, which uh, is titled The Trouble with Negative Emissions. And that also very nicely outlines uh, some of these uh, concerns or, or summarizes a lot of the literature, but there are other papers which uh, are excellent to summarizing. So um, 
as a recognition of these uh, concerns, actually there have been some efforts to, uh, to produce scenarios that avoid these. Uh, unfortunately, so far only one uh, such uh, scenario exists, which also made it into the, uh, the mainstream IPCC presentations. But for example, also the one and a half degree report of the IPCC depicts the lead scenario, uh, the low energy demand scenario, which uh, also lacks, uh, uh, doesn't rely on negative emissions technologies and has already, although it doesn't uh, uh, articulate any principle of degrowth, de but it already um, works with uh, another scenario of economic development. And certainly the, the IEM community or the community near the IEMs, so the, near the integrated assessment monitors, uh, there is a strong community developing who is working on scenarios which, um, which are uh, closer, not fully um, as, um, as stringent on uh, degrowth as this particular scenario, but there are more and more, uh, uh, there is more and more recognition that, uh, that we do have to question the, uh, at least the rate of growth uh, and, uh, and how far that, that growth uh, is taking place. Now, uh, on, from, um, from the perspective of the intergovernmental panel on climate change, it's, uh, this is a very difficult uh, concept because, um, uh, because I, I think, uh, Linda, you already hinted at this, that there is, a, of course, a very major um, gap between the global north and the global south in terms of uh, where we are with consumption levels and where we are with fulfilling our what you call human needs. But simply already the question, you, you put the question in the, in the presentation, um, uh, let's us determine uh, how we live in uh, 2050. Now that's a very difficult question. Who is the we? Who is the we who get to determine how much uh, we should consume and what's the optimal level of consumption? And it's probably a difficult question even in the global north. Um, to me, the most uh, vivid um, proof of this is the, the pandemic or not necessarily the consumption, but one would think that in our societies, certainly lives matter more than economic growth, right? But still it is our richest societies which have failed the worst in protecting lives against, uh, against economic interest in, in the pandemic. And it is precisely some of the uh, poorer countries who have excelled much more, much better in, um, in protecting their lives in the pandemic. So I think it's not that easy to say that if the people are allowed to have their say, what will happen? But anyway, that's, uh, that takes a bit, uh, it's a bit of a side route of my discussion. So I was discussing how uh, in IPCC we are addressing this. But the point is that, that yes, certain, uh, many IPCC in intergovernmental panel. So it's important to understand that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, our principles are that we are policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. And some countries are very sensitive about uh, us assessing options or at least uh, bringing options to a high level in the IPCC, which may assume that somebody else is trying to prescribe their living standards and, and putting a cap on their development. And there is a very high level of sensitivity uh, to this, especially if you understand our, our history of colonization and so on, and this is especially sensitive. Nevertheless, uh, the, I think one of the important words to um, to degrowth, which you haven't mentioned, Kai, but in, in the literature that resonates very much with the growth, the concept of sufficiency. So sufficiency does uh, appear, for example, in the outline of the six assessment report, accepted outline, government accepted outline in six assessment report. So we do accept, uh, expect that also the final um, assessment report will, um, will discuss this concept. Uh, and also it's very important that the first time in the IPCC history, we have a whole chapter devoted to demand and services. So that is exactly um, where we are discussing uh, these, how can we influence uh, energy demand? How 
uh, do we still supply services, which is also uh, very much resonate with your concepts of good life or well-being, or I don't remember what exactly, what were the words you exactly used for it, but but that was the older concept of, uh, of this, that actually we don't need energy per se, we don't need CO2 emissions per se, what we need is a good life, what we need is services from the energy, so let's see how we can supply these services without, uh, without actually um, having to compromise uh, without having to um, increase energy demand and, and, and emissions. So these uh, are going to be addressed uh, in uh, the fifth, in the sixth assessment uh, report. So uh, let me see if there was anything else that I wanted to add. For example, one thing is that I think the number of appliances may not necessarily be a good indicator of, um, because for example, also the lead uh, scenario showed that in fact today, uh, just one appliance actually uh, substitutes about uh, 20 appliances that we have now in the um, in the household and replaces a lot of the needs. So there is some level of technological development which which helps towards this goal. But uh, absolutely, that's true. That, that I think there is a recognition that in a long time decoupling has never uh, uh, taken place. Uh, one item that I think is extremely important to understand, and I don't know how much this can be um, recognized, is is that we are not talking about averages and 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 I think that's what is the trick but it's personal view that's also important for IPCC to uh, make our readers understand and then it's the whole is um, the whole con these concepts will be less controversial that even in the global north there are tremendous inequalities so even uh, for us it's uh, I forgot the exact number but the, the, the report came out just a few weeks ago again that just 0.1 percent of uh, the population emits, um, I think, a few dozens uh, of uh, the total emissions. So uh, even, uh, so that's also why population is a bit irrelevant because it still shows that in the last four decades, the, the global south, even though population increased uh, by more than twofold, their emissions virtually haven't increased at all. Nevertheless, uh, those of the richest, just during the pandemic, uh, the one percent uh, of the, uh, the global population gained. Who uh, um, uh, oh, I forgot, but maybe someone else can better, but knows better. But a very significant amount of wealth during uh, these uh, just these couple of months. So clearly, these uh, the issue is much more about these inequalities of emissions, and that's very much true in the global north as well. So when we talk about sufficiency, or or or. Um, uh, or, or a cap in growth, then I think what we really need to question is who, uh, where do we draw that line and, and how, do we, how do we achieve that? And just one uh, final point uh, and, and uh, for final concept that I, where I want to draw your attention to, which is really important, the so-called decent living standards. This is the term that uh, has been used a lot uh, in the scientific literature about this, and there is, of course, a lot of discussion. What is the decent living standards, which you called, I think, human needs? Where can we draw that line? Where, how can we make people happy and, and fulfill their needs, um, but not uh, cause overconsumption? And that, for example, um, what's her name? Um, Anyway, one of our authors, uh, I will remember her name. Uh, yes, Julia Steinberger, for example. She uh, is uh, uh, one of the uh, in very important scholars, young uh, female and very dynamic scholars who produces a lot of literature on this. And we are, and she's also an, an author on the Sixth Assessment Report, for example. So we definitely have authors in, in uh, the, the report who are addressing uh, these issues. So, so I think instead of seeing this black and white, I think it's more productive to see the whole society debate about uh, this question and how perhaps we can have a, a wider community on board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, so that was very, very rich and um, a lot of aspects that we can pick up upon. Maybe just one follow-up question on um, on AR6, so the upcoming sixth assessment report that, um, that is coming out sometime next year or the year after, depending on COVID-19 uh, timelines. Um, 
Um, so are you expecting, if you look at um, what is happening in the literature um, and in, in the sci in, you know, the modeling community debates, are you expecting um, a lot more scenarios that, for example, try to limit consumption and production in the global north, like um, the LED scenario did, or is that something you're, you're expecting to happen? Uh, my understanding is that there are now more such scenarios. Uh, I don't know yet, and I and I couldn't, shouldn't tell anyway how many or whether these will make it uh, um, into highlight um, into illustrative scenarios. But there are definitely uh, more such scenarios being produced. Unfortunately, they are still in the minority, and that's certainly a concern uh, still of the scientific community. But um, summarizing it where in general the scientific community is that for example i hope i'm not i don't think i'm giving anything important out but we had a very interesting discussion on the summary for policymakers of working group three just to uh, just last week on on communications and the high level messages and it all came down pulled down to uh, the the key authors of and and, and the uh, key clas uh, collaborating lead authors not fully agreeing on the question whether technology only can can do it whether we need even a, a, a transition or, or even whether we need a transformative change or whether we can just solve it all by technology so when you are uh, when when um, this, there are so um, fundamental uh, debates yet in the scientific community. I think the debate that you are uh, showing is a further step uh, from that. But then anyway, I think this is a very important and very interesting debate to have. And I think it's uh, also a very enlightening debate within the scientific community. And it's great that uh, now we will have the latest uh, facts because ultimately the, what the IPCC will do is we'll, we'll put down the, the different scenarios. Um, and then uh, the, the decision or such conclusions can be from, from the people. But what is important to understand, and, and Kai already very well emphasized this, that, that IMs are just one type of modeling tools. They are very important and, and, and very strong, and they have great values because they are the only ones, which we, which we know right now, who can actually tie a temperature goal to uh, to uh, very detailed uh, energy consumption patterns and energy futures. Nevertheless, they are only one type of modeling and they have shortcomings as every model has shortcomings because no model can ever uh, reproduce the whole reality because the model means that it's a simplified version of reality. So it's always important to look at also other types uh, of uh, modeling tools. For example, uh, last week we had a whole week of uh, workshops uh, funded by the Japanese government, uh, which were pre precisely on this. What are the other um, modeling communities doing who are not uh, working with IEMs, but bottom-up models, engineering economic models, uh, um, socioeconomic models, uh, and other social science models? And how can these also complementary inform policymaking as much as IEMs? Today, the problem is that the reason why we are relying mostly on IEMs, first of all, because they are the easiest to, to tie uh, ourselves to temperature goals, but also because these other models, we have not been able to uh, be as organized as the IM community in translating our findings into comparable uh, and um, an upscalable uh, um, products. So now there is a strong uh, effort and finally we may have a similar initiative as the IM community has been very organized and very good in organize and, and, and systemizing their findings and making them uh, very well accessible and understandable. Perhaps we, if we are able to do something similar for other types of models which complement the IA wisdom, I think we will be able to inform uh, um, uh, policymakers better, and and in that, I'm, your model is also uh, could be a very important uh, part. Thank you for that response. So there's a lot of questions in in the Q and A tool. Um, uh, one that was voted up um, is a question, and that's a question to both of you. Um, is you know is the question of how can we um, how can we increase um, the attractiveness, perhaps, or the, uh, the conceivability of broader society, 
how can we how can we make that more palatable to people how can we create and build majorities societal majorities for those more transformative um scenarios and that perhaps you can um you know diana answer that for the scientific community or also broader society and also kai you could respond you can um talk about how um you know how we how can we make the concept of degrowth or the, the necessity of um limiting uh, production and consumption in parts of the world how can we make that more visible in the climate community perhaps that's okay if you want to start perhaps yes thank you i think that's a very very that's uh, the key question and there is this excellent meme i don't know if you have guys have seen it i use it often in my talks uh, in you know a, a speaker is asking the people uh, do you want change and everybody puts up their hands and then the next question is do you want to change and then nobody puts up their hands yes i think this is a little bit the trick that there is a lot uh, that we recognize is important but then nobody wants to really everybody is afraid of of big change in their own lives and um, so, so it's truly a very, very important question. But um, I think one, uh, one important uh, way how to communicate this and to emphasize this, uh, as and I think Kai put uh, his finger on this very well, and so did you, Lina, is that we are not talking about an austerity scenario, or at least I don't know your scenario that much. But when we talk about in uh, our communities, we we have unfortunately we have just failed with an important EU proposal on on uh, developing similar. Um, scenarios but when we were working on on these uh, what we are emphasizing is that we are not looking at austerity scenarios these are not about austerity these are about a better life this is about that you do have time for your kids to play instead of uh, purchasing the the 15th uh, whichever product that you wouldn't need anyway just uh, just because uh, the commercials are brainwashing you that you actually uh, all you want you can only be happier with purchasing that and so on so it's about uh, bell weaving it's about community it's about health it's about uh, a better education for, for more people. But, but I think that the very difficulties, the, the most difficulties that it's not the majority uh, that, that has to be probably convinced for, for such a change, but it's some of the most powerful um, which who own presently also the, you know, the, the largest wealth and who is also today often the, the um, the um, who uh, uh, the barrier towards uh, other uh, changes that we know have to happen. So I think that's that's uh, the, the challenging. But I'm really interested in what uh, Kai's response is. Yes, I, I think I agree with a lot of the, what Diana said. I think um, I I think one thing I want to make sure make clear is that. Um, I don't believe that we save the climate by technology but alone, but I also don't believe that we save the climate um, without changing, without larger change in other, in other areas as well. So I think it's wrong to look at the problem of uh, climate justice um, without looking at things like inequality, racism, sexism, and uh, I think this is this is also where the change could come from. I, th I think we see more and more, at least in Germany and from, from the, the countries that I sometimes read about is that we have a lot of social movements, the climate justice movement, and it's joining forces with other movements such as movements against racism, um, against sexism, for the rights of indigenous people, against class divide, division. And I think seeing these movements come together and see that actually we all want something similar and that is this Big transformation. I think that is a very powerful thing, and then if this is this is kind of where I put my money on, where the change will come from, hopefully. And of course, then politics can can find this topic for themselves and and act on it, and so on and so forth. Um, and also, the second thing I want to say is that it has come kind out of style to talk about the future and to be visionary, and I think we have to do exactly that. We should we should be more visionary than to think than to think about 2100 and just say everything is as it is now but we have these technologies we should come up with like better visions of how we want to live 
And um, I think if you look at the literature, I think uh, especially in the, in the scientific area, there's already I think this movement that these that people begin to think much much bigger again. And I think this is also something that we should all do. We should uh, we should think we should think that we should agree or we should be sure of that that things don't have to stay the way they are and that a better a better future is possible and imaginable and attainable and that it's um that it's worth it to fight for it so to say thank you both so yeah so i guess what we're trying to do also with with the scenario is even if or the, what, what, what we're uh, visualizing in that trajectory is also a response uh, to other societal and ecological global crises, right? We're, we're trying to envision um, trajectories that, that are capable of addressing these crises as well, rather than exacerbating them, for example, through risk technologies or um, endless economic economic growth, even if that's not in sort of the, the heart modeling itself, right? Because that's where you can input in, in, into the model is not all of what we would like to see or all of what we have included in the study, um, which is more kind of surrounding or context um, political measures that we that we think are necessary to accompany the, tra the transformation. Um, one other thing that I wanted to um, briefly uh, pick up is the question of um, the situation we're in right now so um the global pandemic and um what we can perhaps and diana you already mentioned so uh, the the idea is not that we're having degrowth by austerity or degrowth by disaster that's not that's not the point um and i guess in a similar direction um we could say that also a you know a pandemic driven lock economic lockdown is obviously not not what we want but still i would like to um, ask you both um, what it is that you think we can perhaps learn from the experience of the pandemic or um, yeah what it is that um, you think you know that, that is connected to to the climate crisis perhaps um, um, if you see any opportunities in how the pandemic um, was tackled or how you think the two are linked Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, very my, one of my favorite questions, and and I just draw, drew up a box for uh, um, on on what we can learn from the pandemic based on what's in the AR6 uh, for our technical summary. So that I really enjoy that topic. Yes, uh, there we have to see that there are negative and positive trends, but overall, my own uh, perspective and some of the literature really shares this that actually the pandemic gives us a historic opportunity to solve the clim climate crisis. And for several reasons, there are, there, there are many reasons, so, but one is, let's pick those which are, which are more related to this particular discussion. One is uh, exactly about change, that uh, even if many of us realize that, yeah, we should live a little bit differently and, and so on, but the, 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 the scientific literature actually shows that it's very difficult for us to change lifestyles, except, except when we, our lives are undergoing anyway some major change. For example, when we give birth, when we move uh, houses, when we um, start a new job, these are the opportunities when uh, when we get kids and so on. That when uh, so when our situation anyway changes a lot, then we actually are able to fundamentally change lifestyles. So what else is the pandemic uh, now doing to our lives? We are having a, uh, a planetary scale laboratory experiment of lifestyle disruptions. So uh, this is a good chance to actually reflect. On, on really what's important to us and, and that perhaps there are alternative ways of, um, of uh, lives or, or just uh, things that we do in other ways that, uh, that can be done uh, differently and perhaps they are also acceptable. And one uh, in, in that is, is for example, cities and, and urban mobility is something which has been severely uh, disrupted. And what we see also, for example, in, in Germany, but not only in Germany, but many uh, most developed countries in the world that for example, that active mobility has increased uh, several hundred, uh, hundreds of percent uh, during lockdowns, but what we see is that it does not come down significantly after the lockdowns are over. So people actually start to 
enjoy. They realize, wow, actually this isn't so bad. Maybe actually I, I'm actually better off uh, uh, biking to work rather than sitting in my very expensive and fantastic car but being stuck in, stuck in traffic. So of course the, the other trend is there as well that, that unfortunately public transport, um, so lots of people got out of public transport. So that's why I'm saying that there are multiple trends but this is one. But there are also uh, many others. We learned just the fact that that you have invited me for this event now. Probably, uh, you know, a year ago this may not have happened. Now I'm speaking at a many events around the world, and before that, that was not an acceptable uh, option. Uh, this way, I can address three conferences a day globally in different parts of the planet, which which was just not uh, palatable uh, uh, a few months ago. So anyway, we are learning many things in, in a new way, and I think what's really important is uh, to, uh, to recognize what are the positive parts of uh, this transformation that we are going through, especially the digital transformation, because the pandemic has definitely accelerated the digital transformation that we definitely, we have been saying that this is crucial to um, to a low carbon future, uh, to tr uh, transform to service-based and digitally based economy. Uh, but what we need to look at from this mega scale laboratory experiment is what are the aspects which where we can either handle the negative uh, consequences, because we know that there are negative consequences, of course, to social contacts and community and so on, where is when we can handle this and uh, where which and which where is it absolutely positive so that we consciously preserve this, uh, for example, I, I would question whether you know um, high school students do do they really need to go to school every day or could they go let's say do three to two or or at least four to one even in the long term and and there are many new questions to ask but also there are many other aspects uh, all the way from. Um, from uh, you know the very positive uh, shaking up of energy markets, where we see that fossil fuels, I think presently coal is now um, go down by 37 percent, so very significantly since the pandemic, very significant loser from from this pandemic. Whereas we see that uh, renewables are actually really winning from from the pandemic. So there are many many aspects which really have uh, gave, given us a new uh, chance to to win the climate game, and I think this together with the recent developments, which is, for example, the US elections and, and uh, the South uh, Asian, Southeast Asian uh, commitments to climate neutrality, I think definitely these are giving us together uh, or making it that 2020, although it has been a terrible year, but actually it may be such a unique year again as 2015 was with the Paris Agreement with the SDGs. So uh, this may actually give us another chance to continue that the various positive developments of 2015. Thank you, Diana. Kai, you also have a response and yeah, we're, we're soon to finish, so. Please be brief. Sure, I, I try to be brief. I think, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can learn from this pandemic, but maybe the three things I want to focus on is first up, governments are able to introduce measures to, to reduce consumption and production, which was often debated by um, growth um, proponents. Secondly, this does have a very direct effect on emissions, as we can see now. And um, thirdly, I see, I think that right now we see how very much growth dependent or even growth addicted our society is because now that the growth is absent and all these uh, other crises is loom by people lose their jobs and their livelihood, government finances come into jeopardy. And we see that everything is done to spur new growth, just as we saw in the, with the financial crisis, uh, with subsidies for the industrial sectors and all these things. And I, I think the results that the crisis is once once more resolved on the backs of the of the care workers or of the taxpayers and not not on not but not actually touch touching the richer people and um, because they're so important for economic growth and um, so so they stay untouched and i think if we would change our system so that we don't rely on economic growth as much we would also be much more resilient um, when it comes to these crises Thank you both. So as I said, we're at the top of the hour, so we'll close now. Um, this was just, hopefully, just the beginning of um, many more conversations around these topics. Um, 
Thank you very much again to Diana and Kai for being with us today and also to all of you in the audience for your interest. Um, I'm really sorry we didn't get to answer all of the questions that were put to us in, in, um, in the chat box or in the Q&A. Um, so if you have more questions um, or if you would like to discuss any of this further with us, you're, you're welcome to email us. Um, perhaps my colleagues could put our email contacts in the chat box. Um, and we're also, uh, we'll see if we can convene more of those conversations um, perhaps next year. Um, so yeah, thank you very much again. And um, also thank you to all of the people um, who supported um, the event from the technical side. And um, yeah, I wish you all uh, a good and hopefully restful end of this year. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good invitation.